the criminal, the rapist, they're not drying up and they're not going anywhere. It's getting bigger. They're swelling. Unless we do something about it, it's going to explode. They're going to explode all over all of us. Now that's the most cogent reason I can advance. for you being concerned with what happens in Detroit. We have many classic examples of the misconceptions that exist, particularly between Detroit and the suburbs. The belief that in order for the suburbs to get ahead, you gotta keep Detroit down. We're trying to build an airport. It's not really build an airport expand an old airport. Few people remember that the Detroit City Airport was the first airport in the whole of Southeast Michigan. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to go to City Airport, whether it was Paris or Chicago, LA or New York. But that airport has a history. We're attempting to restore it to what it was. It's obvious that Metropolitan Airway, airfield, is overcrowded. It's dangerously overcrowded. The FAA has recommended that they expand Metro, but that still won't take the need. There are certain people in Macomb County attempting to block our airport while they attempt to build one of their own. Now, I'm all in favor of Macomb County having an airport. I think we need an airport in Macomb County. I think we ought to get together with Detroit supporting Wayne, Macomb County, and Macomb County supporting Detroit, rather than get into a mutually destructive civil war. Well, you can use that analogy in almost anything that happens in our relationship. Our relationship expand, expand beyond the suburbs to middle Michigan and even to the UP. I'm sitting next to the editor of UP paper, UP as an upper peninsula. <laughs> I just realized that talking to the newspaper people might have a different connotation. <laughs> and the, the UP, the United Couple for that sort, has many problems which are parallel with those in Detroit. When I was in the Senate, always uh, made an alliance with the representatives and the senators from the peninsula and they would support our bills and they would support ours because we recognize a mutual need well that mutuality of need exists not only between detroit and the up or detroit and warren it exists across the board before i came in uh, a reporter asked me about the relationship between Detroit and Canada. Windsor, to be precise. We've had a very good relationship with Windsor here in Detroit. You know, this is a, a unique thing, but as you gaze out the window and you look south, that mass of land you see is Canada. It's probably the only place uh, in, a, in, the, in the North American continent where due to a little curve in the river, a Canada lies south of the United States. We've been celebrating the Freedom Festival with Windsor, Detroit and Windsor, for a number of years. Their Dominion Day is July 1. That's their Independence Day. And our Independence Day, of course, is July 4th. 
So we started out about 25 years ago celebrating between the first and the fourth. Uh, that celebration has just grown, taking on new dimensions, all types of, of parades and events, and now it extends from from mid-June to mid-July. <laughs> everybody has a ball, and that's good. That way. Everybody makes a party. <laughs> but after July 15, we start throwing rocks at each other <laughs> again. Uh, so it has been in the last couple of years about our incinerator. I'm sure you saw our incinerator. Uh, that incinerator is a half billion dollar project and is the most modern and when it's finished it will be the biggest in the United States. We need a whole, we need about 10 more like that in the state of Michigan. We're running out of landfill, if people don't know it. We are threatening the groundwater. We're threatening to poison ourselves with garbage, unless we do something about it. As of now, that incinerator represents the best answer. The Canadians complain that the emissions emanating from the stack out there will call acid rain cause acid rain. <clears throat> well, it might. We negotiated five years with EPA and DNR. The standards that we have agreed to, that we were forced to agree, we didn't fight it, are state of the art. Whatever happens, to Canada, if it's up those emissions, it happens to Detroit first. So we certainly have a concern with what emissions emanate from that smokestack. And I went over there and I met with them several times. And I told them it's a funny thing. First of all, they went to the newspaper, they didn't come to me. I'm sure the newspapers felt flattered it was a good story. <laughs> they had to have a lot more heat than light. <laughs> Didn't settle anything. I told them that we in Michigan have much more stringent requirements on emissions than they do in Canada. Precisely in Ontario. They have 11 incinerators operating south of the border over here. They couldn't operate one day in Michigan because they would violate our sanitation, our air purity laws. I have a lot of nerves <laughs> to be yelling about us. Now, if it can be demonstrated that the emanations from our stack threaten anybody with acid rain, then we want them to sit down with the state and with the federal government whose requirements we met and together with them work out who's going to pay for it. I think that we ought to do what is necessary in order to ensure pure air. I don't think that we should pay for complying with somebody else's regulations. As much as I hesitate to mention it, there is such a bill, or well, constitutional amendment in this state, known as the Headley Amendment. And the only provision in that amendment is worth a damn. <laughs> is, the, is the one that says, if the state imposes any charges on a local unit of government, then the state shall pay for those charges. And I'll be glad to send the bill to Governor Blanchard. He can pass it on to Prune Face <laughs> while he's still in office. 
<laughs> I feel fairly safe. He's almost gone. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm telling me, they tell me it was not Ronnie who was mad any damn home. It was the astrologer in the family. Who got <laughs> <laughs> you might have also noticed that uh, I've had my differences with the, the press. <laughs> you can tell by the, the warm reception I give you that I love the press. These differences are greatly exaggerated. <laughs> But I do get a little tick. <laughs> when people go headlines or lead electronic news stories with allegations and rumors of some high-ranking official who cannot be named, it is alleged. That's framing in the First Amendment. You know, there's such a thing as a presumption of innocence. It's also a part of our constitutional guarantees in this country. And when you hang a person in the headlines for six months on allegations, doesn't matter if there's not even an indictment. Issue. He's home beyond repair. But I know you outstate press when you do this. <laughs> but the Detroit press, <laughs> the Detroit press won't, doesn't even take the time to say I'm sorry before they rush on to the next allegation, which they publish in the headline. I think that's wrong. I, I would like to see the press control themselves. But I think if the press doesn't control themselves, they're going to go beyond the limits of protection of the First Amendment. And things move with a pendulum motion in this country, oh, period. And when you get to the extreme swing of the pendulum, it starts going back the other way. And I think, starting with Watergate, investigative reporting, you know, then pushing that pendulum, any story, any allegation is fair game. I'm not saying if you get a deep throat story, you shouldn't investigate it, of course. That's what they call an investigative reporter. But if you get a deep throat story and rush to the headlines without investigating, there's a hell of a lot of difference. I think all these Woodbury Pulitzer Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners in Detroit, you know, left out a very important part of investigative reporting. They left out the investigative part. <laughs> All they do is report. <laughs> now, I didn't invite you down here to seize an opportunity to, to bash your colleagues. <laughs> But I just couldn't resist <laughs> the microphone in the audience. I've already talked much too long. I know that I was supposed to say a few introductory remarks and then try and answer your questions. Now, if you've been sufficiently provoked by what I've had to say, <laughs> I will now feel your question. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> as, as, a, as a matter of fact, it's not that simple, though. The restructuring will pull the governance uh, with the Big Four, which is where 98% of the transportation exists, 
and will provide for continuation of the service to the St. Clair, the so-called Collar Counties, St. Clair, Wasserau, Livingston, Monroe. and Monroe. A continuation of the same service. It allows them in the, in the legislation we've offered to pull out if they want to, but they also can stay in and continue to receive the service that they receive. And so we have not been unmindful of the problem. We thought the buses might end Monday morning. No, no, no. As a matter of fact, if, if the, the reorganization of, the, of, that I, of which I'm proposing is a bit forceful to go through, it will be actually the big three. I won't be a part of that. I'll be taking care of the buses in Detroit, DOT, and the other three will be responsible for meeting the, the other needs. But I trust them, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I trust politicians like each of those newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both have good reason. <laughs> You know, I don't know whether they think that the problems of Grand Rapids or, or the western half or isolated or separated from the problems uh, down here or any proportion of the funds we receive are based on well-established criteria need. And now if they're objecting to that, uh, then they're objecting to the basic concept of government, which means that the government of, of, of the whole attempts to deal with the problems wherever they arrive. Uh, you know, you really don't need much of a government if you, if you take in all the money and then pass it out on a per capita basis. And those who settle for per capita today might be in bad shape tomorrow. It just rides, it robs government of its flexibility and sufficient immediate needs. Uh, I don't know what they mean by all the money that's coming out here. I might educate to you. Because there's no such thing as memory and gratitude and politics. <laughs> but for years, uh, Detroit carried the whole damn state on its back. The whole state. Now, I hear this talk about busing. When I was a kid going to Eastern High School in Detroit, the, the points at East Detroit were just beginning to develop and the population had grown faster than the schools. And so they were busing kids from Grosse Point into the Eastern High School in Detroit so they could get a quality education. Now it would seem that maybe some of the people at Grosse Point don't want to reciprocate. We need to help now. Convince suburban communities that they should cooperate with the city. Say everything you say is true and there should be, there should be some transportation. And I don't think there's any more classic demonstration of how the crab in the barrel attitude that we have toward each other defeats uh, the ambitions of us all. <coughs> this area, this region, which is four million people, southeastern Michigan, is the only region of its size or near its size in the nation that has absolutely no vestige of rapid transportation. And part of that stems from the fact that when in 1976 President Ford awarded $600 million to the city of Detroit to build a subway off Woodward Avenue to 8 Mile Road the legislature had a fit, that is the representatives from the suburbs beyond eight mile road. And so did the rest of the people in Semta. And it was never done. Now we cannot continue to exist as a viable metropolitan area without rapid transportation. That affects Grand Rapids too. 
Because if Detroit and the region here <coughs> deteriorates, the state deteriorates. And so this is, a, this is just one example, but I think it's very, very clear if you think about it. So I would suggest that uh, we cooperate on specific projects. Another one, which might materialize, and I hope that it does, <coughs> is we're, we have been proposing a high-speed train between Detroit and Chicago. Now that, as, as you know, that line is 80, 90 percent in Michigan. You know, it goes Detroit or Ann Arbor or right straight out uh, Kalamazoo, et cetera. Uh, I think it would be a big shot in the arm. In the arm. It's like the, well, I would like to see uh, like the French train from Paris to Lyon. Now that's uh, a hell of a train. You, know, you can drink, you have a drink there on the table uh, going 160 miles an hour and it doesn't spill. I saw somebody drinking when I was on there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good example, I think. It is. I think it, it, it has a potential, an economic potential for its home. In the Detroit, for rapid transit or port development, then we should put money in along western Michigan, like in Muskegon. I was up in Muskegon. I did something besides catch fish when I was up there. <laughs> and I was very impressed with the potential of the port of Muskegon. But they don't have enough money on their own to develop that port. Now they were talking about reestablishing a ferry from Muskegon across the river to Milwaukee, I guess. That's a project that's good for Michigan. And I think that we should be concerned with those projects. And there are uh, little uh, port towns up and down Lake Michigan that could benefit from that type of uh, approach. We need to define our needs and we need to help each other to realize that. There's got to be a willingness to cooperate. 